All right. Well, um, hello, everyone, both those that are here live and those that are watching the recording. Uh, Paul and I are going to give a little presentation tonight about um, our remote stations and what we've learned about building remote stations. And uh, we'll be taking turns here talking about things back and forth. Um, we've given this presentation before, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Um, we've updated it with some new things that we've learned and some more uh, tips and techniques that we think uh, are useful for folks. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about just the two of us, the introduction. Um, we'll talk then about you know, why you might want to have a remote station. Uh, what some of the different options are for building remote stations, um, how you get started, some of the operating tricks and techniques that we've learned. Uh, we'll brag then a little bit about our remote stations and uh, finish off with any questions, answers, and uh, maybe a short demo of, of my remote station in operation. Um, and there's a picture of Paul. Hi, Paul. Um, <laughs> Uh, operating remotely from a vacation rental home in Crested Butte, Colorado. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that adventure uh, later in the presentation. So a little bit about myself. Um, been licensed since 1968. Have uh, had various different call signs as I moved around the country. Um, when I came back to Denver uh, eight years ago, um, I lived up in Evergreen, Colorado. That was great. No homeowners association. So I put some antennas up there. Um, my first remote station that I uh, put together was actually at my son's house in September 2018 down in Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico. And uh, that kind of got me started on, on remoting. Um, but then uh, about a year later in June of 2019, um, I set the remote station up that I have now, which is at another Ham's house uh, in the Western Denver area. Um, um, it's all about antennas. Uh, this is part of his antenna farm that you see on the right there. So that's what makes this remote station, uh, you know, wonderful and a wonderful location. And um, then uh, in June of 2020, we moved from Evergreen down to uh, the Aurora area. And we live in a new housing community, 55 plus community, which of course has a homeowners association and all kinds of restrictions. So not likely to be putting up any kind of antennas like this there. Um, use this station extensively, uh, the remote station since June of 2019. And I've made over 20,000 uh, contacts uh, using that station. Uh, many of them during contests. So we'll talk a little bit about contests at the end of this. Paul, you're yeah. on. No, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm an oldie. I was you know, licensed in 64. I'm a Canuck, you know, one of the snowbirds that came down and stayed. And uh, moved to Minnesota first, and then I realized that was a mistake. It's just too cold. And uh, But I was able to get my, uh, my U.S. license there, so... That's where I got NO0T. I didn't pick it, <laughs> somebody else did. Um, and we, we've been in all over the US basically with my job and everything else. And I haven't been doing much operating while I was traveling so much. But uh, <clears throat> we moved into Parker at, in 2000 and uh, set up a small modest antenna, but then we uh, ended up moving to downtown and into a condo. And I, you know, basically uh, I got rid of most of my equipment and, um, and then in 2018, um, uh, my wife uh, said, you know, Paul, you, you're getting underfoot. You need to get, get a hobby again. So we put up a station at my daughter's place. And then uh, uh, I figured out uh, I needed to operate remote because I couldn't be bothering her at all hours of the night. So that's how I got started in this thing. And I, I, I think I got an homie now. I got maybe seven or 8,000 contacts. I haven't updated that, but. We've, we've worked, most of the stuff I work is on six meters. Great. Okay, so um, let's jump into why you might want to have a remote station if you haven't already thought about it. Um, one is just remote access of your home station. Uh, you're out traveling, you're on vacation, 
Um, whatever the reason may be, uh, you may want to uh, you know, access it when you're, when you're not at home. Uh, some people even access it from a different room in their house. Uh, you know, the, the shack may be in the basement or in the garage or up in the bedroom, and they want to play around with ham radio when they're sitting in the family room. So you can even remote within your own house. Um, of course, the thing you usually think about is remote access of another station. Uh, could be a second home that you have, uh, could be a friend's station. Um, you can, as I mentioned uh, just before we start here, you can do multi-operator contesting without physically being at a station. And um, also there's the temptation, um, and we'll mention this here shortly, of uh, using some of the super stations that have been set up uh, for remote operation, either for chasing DX or, or a contest. Um, more and more, many of us are finding uh, that you can't really operate at home uh, due to homeowner CCR restrictions or the ever-growing noise problem that many of us face. Um, as I mentioned, you can operate while traveling uh, or at a vacation home. And last and not necessarily the most important, you can impress your friends with this very cool thing that you've got. Um, and and uh, uh, I think I've done that a few times. Um, so there's kind of four ways that you can set up a remote station. We'll talk about all four of these. One of them is what I'm just calling web browser access. Basically use a web browser and you're able to access a station that's been set up uh, for that form of operation. Uh, there are also software programs that let you remotely access radios and, and other devices. Um, there's some remote panel technology where you can physically have what looks like the front panel of your radio in one location and actually have the radio itself in another location. And then uh, the technique that Paul and I use, which we call remote desktop, and we'll talk uh, more about that as we, as we get into this. So let's talk about web browser access. Well, probably the most famous or infamous form of that is remotehamradio.com. Um, this has been set up and operating for several years now, and the operators or members of the organization have access to 40 plus towers, 200 plus antennas, and more than 20 stations. Um, it's an annual subscription service, and then you also pay per minute. Um, two different levels of, of paid service. Uh, one is uh, $99 a year, plus you pay anywhere from nine to 69 cents a minute uh, for, uh, for using the station. And then the premium stations um, are more expensive, $1,000 a year plus a higher uh, fee. One of the stations they have um, is located in the Northeast and they claim it is the uh, station closest to Europe in the continental United States. So obviously that's a fun thing to operate when there's contests or DX opportunities. And then when I was going back and just checking to see what they were up these days, they've added uh, something that they call the new youth network, which is free if you're 25 years or younger. So they actually give um, younger, newer hams, uh, free access to some of these stations, uh, which I thought was a, a wonderful you know, thing for them to be doing for the hobby and to encourage new people to get in. And in fact, um, you know, I would say if you're part of a radio club and you're trying to introduce young hams to the hobby, this is something that you might want to you know, share with others uh, in your club. Um, what you need on the operating side is a Chrome web browser or an Android phone or a Chromebook, iPhone, et cetera, or even a Flex uh, Mestro type of interface. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, at least one view of the, what you get when you're on the web browser. Uh, you get you know, waterfall spectrum displays. You can operate different modes. Uh, you can turn the antennas, you can operate sideband or CW, or may even be able to operate digital, I'm, I'm not sure anymore. And as you see, you can operate it on, on different devices. And uh, I know these get booked up for contests, um, and there have been some you know, amazing contest scores that have been generated from these stations. And 
they're now starting to set them up in different parts of the world too. I think they have some in Europe as well as domestic. So it's just kind of an interesting, fun thing to, to look into if, if, you're, if you're so inclined. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is software programs. So a lot of the um, major manufacturers have software programs that you can buy to operate um, your remote, your radio remotely. Um, also, some of the old standards like Ham Radio Deluxe have remote operation capability. Um, again, I've listed a number of them here. ICOM has a program, um, program that I use, uh, Win for ICOM. There's a Win for Yesu and also for K3. Uh, again, some great software programs that will let you operate your stations remotely, which basically means that Again, your equipment's in, in one location and then you're in another location uh, operating the radio. And uh, here's just some examples of the sort of virtual front panel displays that some of these programs have. Um, interestingly enough, uh, for me, the, the one on the lower right hand corner is what I use. It, it goes with my ICOM 7600. I actually like it better than the front panel of the actual radio. Uh, it gives you better access to the radio and it, I've become so accustomed to it that whenever I visit my remote station and I'm sitting in front of the rig, I don't even remember how to use it anymore, quite literally. <laughs> it, this, is the, the, this is my ICOM 7600 as far as I'm concerned. Um, remote front panels, there's a, company called Remote Rig that makes this uh, set of equipment here. Um, it's basically kind of a remote modem, if you will. And um, you can, you can uh, control your radio, uh, you can transfer audio back and forth um, and some station control. It works with any of the radios that have the physically separable front panels. So like the ICOM 7100, um, you know, uh, some of the Kenwood and Yesu radios. Um, you can also use a PC at the location, but it's very cool certainly to be able to have a physical radio panel uh, sitting in front of you. And last time I checked, there was about $500 for the pair. Um, I know some hams that, very, that, that use this very successfully and are very happy with, with the operation um, using this equipment. And here's kind of a little picture, maybe a bit hard to see, but essentially you have your, you at, at the remote station, you have your, your radio, maybe an amplifier, a rotator, all these things are plugged into one of the modem units. And then you communicate over the internet to another modem unit where you can have a speaker, a microphone, CW paddle, um, and then the front panel of the radio. Um, so again, there's some, you can kind of, if you want to carry this around with you in a little suitcase and you know have what feels like a radio right in front of you, pretty pretty neat idea. A um, bit higher scale is what Flex offers in terms of their Maestro. Um, works with several of their models. Um, you know, obviously the Flex radios are quite sophisticated and uh, you know perform perform very well. Uh, I know Mark, who was just on here a few minutes ago, uh, operates his station remotely. Uh, it's W0QL, and he uses the Maestro system to do that. And we've heard of uh, many other people that do the same things. Um, you can even have maybe, as, as it shows here, you know, two operators operating one radio. Not that that would ever cause any confusion, of course. Uh, okay, so remote desktop. This is again is a technique that Paul and I use. Um, the basic premise is that you, is that you have a computer at at your remote station, and you run uh, all the software for controlling all your equipment on that computer. So all the programs are running local at that remote station, and then you use a remote desktop uh, to just uh, basically. Uh, replicate the screens, uh, transfer the audio, um, and some other control functions uh, to that location. And this lets you use all your favorite software. They don't have to have been built to be uh, remotely operated. So there's a real advantage there. Um, you do need a remote desktop program. 
and uh, you see basically what's on what be on the monitors or screens uh, of the shack computer which means that anything you want to control does have to have some kind of software application that lets you do that that control um, there's a number of, of software uh, packages that you can use um, you know, it used to be we all said we'd use TeamViewer, but they kind of changed their terms a couple of years ago. So I'd say don't use TeamViewer, even if it seems like it's working for you. It probably won't uh, once you use it for any period of time. Uh, Paul and I use a program called Splashtop. Uh, one of the nice things about it is it lets you run uh, multiple monitors simultaneously. Um, if you have all these software programs, and you'll see my uh, desktop here in a little bit, uh, it's really hard to get them all on one screen. I have two screens. Paul had to one up me. He's got four screens, um, but uh, you don't necessarily need four. <laughs> and there's some free things. There's AnyDesk. It works lovely. We use AnyDesk as kind of a backup uh, package. Uh, the free version works very well. And then I've listed, you know, some other uh, products that are, are available to, to use. And again, as I said, uh, this is the technique that Paul and I use to do our remote stations. Um, here's just a quick image of, of my two monitors, and I'll show it to you live here at the end of the presentation. But as you can see, I've got you know, a fair amount of software running here, uh, and it, it takes up you know, a fair amount of screen real estate to, to do all that. Um, so what do you need? Well, um, you're going to want a transceiver with computer control. You need to be able to control the transceiver, you know, via some form of software program. So it needs to have a cat type control. Um, you may need some audio interfaces, uh, depending on, you know, if you want to be able to hear things uh, back at, at the remote at, at your local location, uh, or sometimes you need, you know, if you're using digital modes, obviously you have to have those interfaces. Uh, you can set up a CW interface. We've got a couple of things listed uh, in the appendix. Uh, Paul and some other folks have set that up um, very successfully. Uh, you do need a, a PC computer at that at the shack at your at your remote site. Um, needs to be configured to boot on power up. So you're not going to be there to type your you know password and everything else into the computer. So you can go in and it's real easy to do, set up your PC so that whenever it's powered up, it will boot up all the way to the desktop. Um, and that's obviously gonna be connected to your transceiver and any other equipment uh, you wanna control. Um, you don't have to have a very high-end computer, but you need a decent one. Um, you know, anything that's been built in the last couple of years, you know, uh, we use Windows computers, uh, wouldn't have to be, but that's what we use. Um, next, most important thing is you're going to want remote power control. You're going to want to be able to turn equipment on and off uh, remotely. Um, Paul and I use uh, some Wi-Fi AC outlets, uh, but there's some other options we'll, we'll talk about here. And you need a good internet connection. Now, ironically, the part that has to be good is the uplink. Um, or the reverse path, because that's that's where you're um, bringing back the images of your screens, and you need, you know, maybe a, about a megabit or so of bandwidth to do that. Uh, typically, you need need less less bandwidth, um, you know, when you're sending things to the station. You know, it might be your voice, it might be some key clicks. Obviously, it's nowhere near the bandwidth requirement that you need to render several screens of content you know in, in good resolution uh, so again most internet connections will work um, but that's one thing you do have to have to keep in mind um, then the software that you're going to run on that remote computer something to control your radio um, other operating software you may as, as i mentioned want an audio link either for single sideband operation or just to be able to hear what's on the, on the radio. Um, you know, you can operate FT8 without ever listening to it, but sometimes it's, you know, a little bit more comforting to be able to, to hear it. Um, again, you may want a digital voice here uh, um, for contest operation. Um, 
You may, of course, if you have a, an amplifier or antenna tuner, you, you want to control that remotely, you're going to need some software that does that. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, if you have multiple antennas, maybe more than your radio or amplifier can switch, you may need an antenna switch. And of course, if you have uh, uh, beams you want to turn, you're going to need rotator control. Again, um, you know, quite a bit of existing equipment uh, has this functionality or can be modified uh, to do that. Uh, so how do you get started? Well, first thing is you have to figure out what equipment you're going to use and how you interface to it. Uh, select the software that you want to use. Uh, determine that power control technique. How are you going to turn your power on and off remotely? Um, you may, depending on the software you're using, need to do some configure, configuration of internet or routers. You might have to open a port for certain software to operate. Um, and, you know, you can try a lot of this out at home just by doing it over your local network. As I mentioned, some people, that's all they ever do. They operate their ham station in the basement from the family room, something like that. Um, and also, it's really handy to have somebody uh, to kind of work through some of this with a, a buddy that's done it or, you know, <clears throat> may have certain skills that you don't have. <clears throat> if there's some computer or router configuration that needs to be done, having somebody that understands all that obviously can, can be helpful too. Uh, plus, Paul and I have sometimes found like, you know, it doesn't work and you just have to have somebody to kind of talk the whole thing through. Um, so speaking of internet latency routers, you need a good internet connection. You know, it doesn't have to be a gig. <laughs> um, you know, you need a, you know, a couple megabits per second, but it needs to be reliable. It needs to have, you know, kind of, it needs to have low latency. So a satellite internet connection is not gonna work for you. Um, it's gonna, you know, satellite being like the HughesNet type satellite, not, not Starlink, but anything that's, you know, um, very high in the sky, the latency is, will just drive you crazy and it just won't, won't work for you. Um, internet enabled remote power switch with reboot. This is an interesting thing. So uh, Paul and I have been fortunate that the locations that we have our stations at, uh, there are people there. <laughs> and they can, uh, you know, if you ask them, they can turn the power on and off or plug something in and, you know, pull it out and plug it back in again in case it got stuck, right? Uh, if you're at a much more remote location, um, sometimes you need to not just, uh, you know, be able to control something, but the internet goes down and you need to reboot your modem or your router. Uh, these devices, uh, and there's a picture of one here, and I think we mentioned some in the appendix. Um, these are interesting power control devices because you can, you can uh, power them on and off remotely, but also they will monitor the internet. Um, and if the internet fails, then they, were, they will power cycle themselves. Um, and if you plug your router or modem in there, it gives you an opportunity to power cycle that remote device in case for some reason, it's off in la la land and not talking back to, to its mothership. So there, there's you know, some nice things that you can buy that will help with, with that problem. Um, we found pretty much, Paul, in all the operating we've done that we really don't deal with any latency issues. Um, you know, uh, sound cards, CW interfaces, foot switches remotely, all, all these things you know, seem to work pretty well with the internet connections at least we've operated at, including ones where we've traveled around even outside the country uh, and operated our stations. Um, so I don't think it's gonna be a big issue. Again, just don't think you can use one of the high orbit satellite internet services. Um, routers, yeah, sometimes you may need to open a port or play around with firewalls a little bit to get a few things going. Again. Uh, you can Google for most things or sometimes, you know, buddy that knows a little bit more about IT can, can help you out there. Most of the software that we use, we've never had any uh, configuration issues where we had to go in and fiddle with things. 
Uh, there's one or two programs we've used where we had to you know, open a port or, or something like that. Okay, so what are some of the tricks that we've learned? Well, again, I think start simple. Start by controlling your transceiver, get the basics running, then add more devices and software as you go. Um, you might want to try a digital mode first. It might be simpler than setting up CW or sideband uh, with, with your remote set situation. Um, one of the things that I do, because I have to start up about six or seven or eight programs, is um, I use a macro recorder player like Tiny Task, which is free, um, to, to actually start my software up. So every time my computer boots up, uh, it runs this set of macros, which basically start all my programs for me. So by the time I connect in, you know, a couple minutes later, everything's up and running and ready for me to use. Um, again, make sure you have the AC power control solution. That's a lifesaver. Um, you know, your computer or software may freeze. Um, you may need to power cycle some piece of equipment. Um, you may need to power down during storms. The, um, the picture in the upper right actually is a little uh, power control unit that Paul built. Um, so the typical AC con Wi-Fi AC controller is 110. Well, for those of us that run amplifiers and need 220 or something, you need to be able to switch uh, the power to your amplifier. So you can build a little uh, remote relay like Paul has. So it's, it's powered by 110 volts, but it switches 220. Um, I'm, you know, we, won't, we won't give a lesson on how to build that here tonight, but uh, that's worked very well in terms of being able to switch off um, you know, higher powered equipment. Um, for remote CW, uh, I'm going to say check out WinKey Remote. Uh, again, we have um, links in an appendix uh, that have all the you know, site information for these things. And then something that Paul and I learned um, fairly early on was there was no reason to have monitors connected to this remote computer. There's nobody there to watch them, right? So why spend the money, <clears throat> particularly if you have dual monitors or four monitors or something else, uh, when you can buy what's called a dummy headless monitor plug. And that's uh, these two items here is a VGA one, but here's an HDMI one. These plug into the back of your computer and make your computer think that a monitor is connected. One of the great things about them is you can uh, set them to very high resolutions if you want. Uh, so you don't have to have an expensive monitor connected and you can get you know, 2K or 4K resolution if that's you know, what you wanna display on the other end. So very, very cool little devices, very inexpensive. I think they're like 10 bucks each or something like that. Um, in fact, when I go to my remote station to operate, because I don't have any monitors there, I take my notebook computer and I run the station remotely, even when I'm sitting right in front of it, uh, because that's the only monitors that I have available to use. Um, also, and again, mentioned in the appendix, uh, some great sites, K6 uh, UFO has a lot of information about remote stations, and then Mark W0QL has a very interesting and entertaining blog that he's put together about building his solar-powered remote station um, east, of, east of Denver. Um, so now, Paul, it's back to you. We're going to talk about your station a little bit. Okay, thanks, Bill. Well, the, uh, the, the station I had uh, located uh, at my daughter's place, uh, KE4 I choose. She's, she's got a, a three-story place over at Sloan's Lake. And so my wife said I needed a hobby. And so she was gracious enough to let me set up uh, my station there. And... Uh, and I uh, started off with a couple of uh, M-squares and uh, initially went to a couple of uh, Innova antennas, uh, the LFAs, because of the uh, downtown noise I have here. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very noisy in the city. However, I've got like, I don't know, 40, I don't know, 40 some odd, 49 countries so far, maybe 50 something, and uh, working my way up on six meters. Um, also could put up some low band antennas to sprung at the side of the house. 
Um, the station itself is pretty simple. Uh, I've got it listed here with all the uh, all the parts I've got here, and uh, works uh, pretty good. In, it, it integrates pretty easily. Let's put it that way. And um, I'm using a, uh, a Windows 10 computer. Now, one thing you may want to look consider is if you go over to Newegg, um, their website. Uh, they have these. Uh, if you have to, if you search for reconditioned uh, computers, they have. They have these uh, uh, nice uh, Livono uh, computers. You can get like a, a, a reasonably good one. I, I have a seven um, Windows uh, i7 right now. And I think I paid 350 bucks uh, for the computer um, uh, from, uh, from Newegg. And works like a charm, it's fast. Uh, you'll find when you're doing remote operating that the computer you're using does not have to have a lot of RAM. I, I have like four windows, a whole bunch of stuff going on. I'm only using five gigs worth of RAM, but my processor is sometimes hitting like 90%. So this, anything you're doing with, with uh, uh, digital and remote ends up using a lot of processor power. One of the things that you may want to consider is make sure you've got um, really good um, mem uh, video cards. Bill mentioned this on one of his other slides. And have video cards with a good memory on them because you don't want to use your computer's processing power to render your uh, video uh, path back to your uh, uh, back to your home so that's just a little thing I, I've learned over the over the past couple of years I've now had some you know I use different room, uh, video cards to uh, to get to get what I have right now uh, we're lucky they got some um, they had some uh, uh, web, uh, CenturyLink uh, had some fiber coming right behind my daughter's place. And so we signed up for that one gig both ways. And at the building I'm in right now, WebPass came in with one gig uh, uh, symmetrical uh, and very reasonably priced. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was a no brainer for me. Um, we, Bill and I both upgraded to uh, Splash Top Business. And that was because Splash Top business allowed us to run uh, N plus one monitors. I'm not going to have eight monitors if I want, wanted to, but <laughs> I don't think I could probably live with that. But four, four is what I use because it, it allows me to put some other things on the other screens like um, PSK Reporter and, and uh, I can look up QRZ anytime I want and, and, uh, and so on. So rather than having everything squished together on one screen, I've got it spread out a little bit so it makes, makes it easier for me to read it. And uh, Bill and I use any desk as kind of our over the shoulder monitoring. So when Bill's operating a contest using splash top, I can look over his shoulder using any desk and see what he's, what he's seeing and vice versa. So it's kind of a, a cool, a cool setup. Um, again, I use the, uh, the remote uh, Wi-Fi connectors which I you know which I, I, I have working on my uh, on my iPhone here and it makes it so much easier to turn the power on and off etc um, I don't have I, I, I don't know but maybe my system's a little bit different but um, when I when I close down my station I basically just close down the logging program that's that's the main one that's that always the computer complains about if I try to try to close down the computer but uh, once I uh, close the close the uh, uh, logging program, which is uh, AC log, then uh, I can just I can cut the power to the computer completely, and it comes back perfectly the next time. So that's that's kind of one of the things we've been doing. Next slide, Bill. Uh, so this is kind of my station now. That's a that's an early picture of my my station when I had just two monitors. And you can see it's a little bit cluttered, but you know you know it worked for me at the time. I use a wind key or remote. Um, so um, I, I'm a CW guy, so I, I like to use uh, uh, CW when I can. And I was able to hook up uh, the wind key or remote, it's the same box at both ends. You can just see it underneath the two monitors there. And uh, it worked like a charm. And the only problem we have with, when you're working remote CW is the side tone. And <clears throat> if you're not careful, you'll be hearing this, the, the side tone coming back from the receiver at, or the radio at the other end. And it's of course delayed and it just drives you nuts trying to send CW. 
So what I did was there's a uh, port on the back of that uh, uh, a remote uh, uh, wind keyer, which allows me to uh, uh, close the PTT at my end. And basically I, I just mute the audio. When I send, I, I just listen to the, the side tone coming out of the uh, wind keyer. So that, that, that's how I do CW. And for foot switches, uh, we use some other software, uh, which we uh, found out from another ham. And uh, that was, uh, what was it called, Bill? Remod, right? Yeah, uh, yeah Rem Remod, or R-E-M-A-U-D, which is written by a, a German guy. And it, it has very, very fast, uh, um, or very low latency, let me put it that way. The software is built so that it works fast. So you can hear what's happening at both ends. And it also has a PTT function. So if you close the contact on the, on the, uh, Serial port at your at your home, uh, the uh, the other uh, at the other end it, it closes the contact as well, and uh, that way you can you can uh, use your, your foot switch when you're operating sideband, so you don't have to mess around with keys or any of that kind of stuff. Hey Paul, I noticed I, I was looking more closely at the photo there. Yeah, and that's actually you're accessing my station. Oh. From your house must have been during the contest because I see N one M up on the screen. <laughs> I can see your two monitors. Sorry, I, sorry, I called it busy. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Busy, All sorry. right. Moving on. So, uh, yeah, kind of radio equipment I use right now is it's uh, I'm using Air, AirSpy R two and uh, AirSpy HF Plus Discovery for the receivers. I use the. Um, the ICOM just for just for uh, uh, transmit. The filters that are that are in the Air Spies are miles above what I have in the uh, 756 Pro 3. Um, I mean, it's it's just that the Pro 3 was built back in you know, what 2000. So uh, uh, luckily for me, uh, the, the the new these new SDRs are, are really cool. And you kind of get the idea from the picture of you know, all the different controls I've got to uh, different audio and, and uh, so on. I've operated RIDI, I've operated sideband, I've operated CW and I've operated phone uh, on low band and, and on six meters over the, over the, over the years. The LA1K uh, amp, I, I got that because uh, I wanted to have some power on six. And nice thing about it is it had a uh, RS-232 port in the back and I was able to get uh, together with some guys to uh, come up with a icon uh, of the of the transceiver. And nice thing is too, they're they're also U.S. based, which makes turnaround times really fast if you're if you have a problem with the amp. So getting the right control cable that was my biggest problem getting onto onto a digital. I just, I said, like, you know, I, I tried all kinds of things and, and, and cables and stuff. Finally, uh, somebody suggested, hey, why don't you look at XGG comms it, 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 in, uh, over the UK? I said, why that? He said, well, they make a lot of cables for, for remote operating, uh, you know, for computer operating of your radio. And I, I checked them out and uh, the fellow there is really, really good and comes really fast. Uh, like in a couple of days, you get the cable, and it's got a built-in uh, audio um, card, uh, USB sound card, so I don't have to mess around with my audio uh, connections on the back of my computer, uh, and it all goes in, you know, all comes via USB, so it's all digital all the way, you know, except when it comes, you know, hits that uh, sound card in the cable, but it's really, really good, and uh, never had any audio problems with uh, with that cable, and never had any control problems because he custom makes the uh, the connectors on the back for your accessory plug on the back of your radio. So this will this will work on pretty much any radio that's listed there, there uh, that, that has cat control. And here's an example. This is what the cables look like, and you can see the audio, uh, the, uh, the little box in the middle. Of it. That's an optical. Uh, 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 what do you call it, Iso uh, iso-optical <laughs> connector or something in there. Uh, anyway, it, it basically makes it sure that you don't end up getting, getting uh, uh, your uh, computer uh, noise into your, into your uh, radio. 
And also too, virtual audio cables. There's another thing that, that uh, I found out. I know that uh, um, there's a lot of them on the marketplace and uh, I, I started using a free one, but I ended up having all kinds of you know, audio distortion issues from time to time, couldn't figure out why, blah, blah, blah. Ended up just spending 30 bucks and bought one from this guy, Mushenko. And uh, that's what everybody seems to seems to like to use. And uh, um, uh, and he gives you free updates online. It's it's simple, and you can have like you know 15 different audio or more uh, audio streams going in your computer between one application and the other application. So there's no uh, there's no analog in any of this stuff. So no no, dis no uh, distortion issues. And the uh, the professional version works really really well. But you got to be careful. There's some other guys out there selling virtual audio cables, but I don't think they work as well as Mushenko's. And again, Paul, you, you use this, for example, for connecting your SDRs, I think, to other devices, right? Yeah, exactly. Like the, yeah, the audio coming out of your... See, one thing Bill and I... Well, Bill, Bill, Bill taught me was that you can, have, you can have like multiple devices accessing the same audio port. It's not like COM ports. So um, it, it, it's a way to like the SDR puts out audio but it's all digital because the SDR is connected directly to a USB port. So it's, it's all digital audio uh, at that point. You don't have to go to speakers or anything. Although yeah. Bill likes to listen, Bill likes to listen to FT8, but I, to me, it drives me nuts. You, know? I, <laughs> you, you probably don't like, you probably like listening to MSK 144 too. Right. You know, I, I still cannot decode FT8 or RIDI in my head. I don't know what's wrong after all these years. I still can't, can't do it. it. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. Anyway, and then the other one is this virtual COM ports. Um, uh, Dave, uh, WO2X, uh, uh, out in, um, I guess he's, he's on the East Coast of New Jersey, I think. Anyway, he, uh, uh, he shared this tip with me that <clears throat> you can get, uh, multiple applications accessing the same COM port. And so what this program does is it, it has this, if you look the third line down, it'll do a splitter. And um, so what I, have, what I have going on here is I've got, I've got like all these applications, I want to synchronize their frequency, right? Because they don't want to have to go like, okay, change the receiver frequency. Okay, now change the transmitter frequency. Now change this band, change that thing. So rather than doing through all that sort of stuff, I've got I've got uh, MS uh, uh, I got uh, the JT um, what am I trying to think of here uh, not, not JT alert but uh, JT, JT DX and I've got WSJT yeah. and I've got um, the SDR console and my my uh, H HRD which is controlling my radio and my and my logbook all synchronized so that. I don't have to. I don't have to put in the frequency anymore. I just have to, you know, either click on the on the on the mode I want to operate, and, and WSJT figures it out what frequency I need to go on, or I click on my uh, my SDR console, and that switches it over to another uh, another uh, slice I'm using uh, on my receiver. Uh, again, like four years or five years ago, I had no idea how to do any of this stuff. So this is something you, I've learned over the years, and uh, but. Nowadays, it's available pretty much to anybody. What's it doing? And uh, this, this, this was my uh, station over at my daughter's place. As you can see, no monitors, <laughs> and and uh, it just kind of like I got one tiny little corner of her of her uh, of her room up there. I changed the rotator from that uh, uh, ham radio or the uh, uh, what's that? That's the uh, High gain, high gain, right? Uh, the, the tail twist I, I switched it over over to the uh, the AC twenty eight hundred, and uh, that that that, uh, that works out pretty well. Yeah. And then here's what your station looks like today, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is kind of like what I've got going on today. As you can see, um, uh, up on the top left hand corner, I've got uh, I've got the SDR console with multiple. Uh, uh, parts of the six meter band in there. And I can change very quickly by just clicking on one of those uh, slices and it switches it over. And I got over on the right, you've got Ham Radio Deluxe. Uh, like Bill, I, I can't operate my Icon 756 Pro 3 uh, anymore. I have to use this thing because I got all the sliders at the bottom of the screen 
and Ham Radio Deluxe works pretty good. <clears throat> you can see down below, I'm using Ham Radio Deluxe for the rotator. And uh, that's a, I like it because it's got all the grid squares. You know, I don't have to think. Uh, if I see a station from EM34, uh, I can just click on the, the grid square EM34 and the, the beam just goes there. So that, that's kind of, you know, I, I can go off and do something else. I don't have to worry about where the beam pointing. On the right, I've got, uh, on the bottom right, they've got my uh, AC log, uh, which, is, which works great for contesting as well as uh, just my regular log. <clears throat> on the left side, I've got the left of, uh, of the bottom there. You can see I've, I'm running uh, JTDX <clears throat> and uh, JT Alert, which is a great tool uh, that Bill, Bill showed me. And plus I've got the, uh, my uh, LA1K amplifier icon there, which has all the, all the uh, uh, telemetry that I need to uh, know what's going on with the amp. <clears throat> here's, the, here, here's a picture of the SDR console, I think, which is by the way, a free piece of software. Um, and, but it, it, it's like a uh, uh, very professional grade. Uh, if you had to buy this software, it would be the thousands of dollars, but for ham radio, it's, it's, uh, it's free. And you can see the various uh, screens that I've got on there. <clears throat> um, I don't know if you can't see my cursor, I don't think. <laughs> well, that, that's a whole other presentation, Paul. Yeah, that is a whole other presentation. And, we'll, and I've got Paul at N2EME uh, going to be uh, helping us uh, with that uh, next month. Uh, I think on the uh, 14th of October, uh, which should be a Wednesday, but that's, uh, that's what we're doing then. The other thing is this node red interface. Uh, I, I didn't know how to interface to Palstar because Palstar didn't have a, had, didn't have a computer interface to their, to their amplifier. And I uh, found out talking to uh, uh, some folks, uh, VA3MW, um, um, <clears throat> he, he has, he has a, uh, remote station about 130 miles northeast of northeast of Toronto that uh, he operates uh, all the time because he, he's in the city of Toronto and uh, he's using node red for for hooking things together he's got um, what do you call those raspberry pi uh, computers to uh, to to do things for him and uh, but the nice thing about it is easy to, to wire things together on a screen I'll show you the next screen here should show you that yeah, so there you can see, <clears throat> the, literally you just grab onto one of these things and pull it over to another thing, and that's how you program it. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it's pretty good if you got somebody that's smarter than me. <clears throat> but um, um, uh, Dave uh, uh, W02X uh, uh, showed me how to do this, and uh, I've done a few mods myself and changed a few things. But it, it's pretty uh, it's pretty slick uh, software, and again, it's free. And uh, it, you could really do a lot of stuff. This is what my icons look like. <clears throat> you can see the uh, I have I actually have two different ones. I can I just I just made that up myself uh, to where you know where I wanted to put stuff. is It's a really simple program. If I can do it, anybody can do it because I I'm, think, not very, I'm not very computer savvy. <laughs> yeah. So the the great thing here was the LA1K does did have a serial port and it did have you know, the ability to control and retrieve information from the amp. But for some unknown reason, Palstar has never written a desktop control program. Yeah, because it was designed originally that the, the, the port on the back was designed to run, uh, run their um, auto, yes. <clears throat> auto tuner. Yeah. Right, right. So, so, the, so those two things were talking back and forth. And so I was able to get the command set from... Um, uh, Paul at uh, Palstar, one of the owners, and um, and and I shared that with uh, some of the No Red guys, and they were able to pull this together. And they actually have a, a, a what do you call it, a group that, that does a lot of this stuff, and they've got all the flows already figured out for a lot of different radios. So <clears throat> it's a good place to go. Here's an example of the uh, Flex 6600 uh, with uh, stuff, and this is this is uh, from another. Uh, Another hand, their W7 and IK, but you can kind of see what kind of stuff you can get going with this node red. Yeah, you can come up with all kinds of projects, right? Yeah, this is this, this is much more complicated than anything I could do, but yeah. it works for me <laughs> anyway. Yeah. All right, so just uh, I'll spend just a couple minutes on my station. Um, 
Again, this presentation will be posted uh, into the files section of the, the Front Range Six Meter Group's IO site. Um, but uh, again, I have this station located in other Ham's house and I'm able to use his assortment of antennas when he's not using them. Um, and he has a very nice set of antennas, as you can see here. Um, my main radio is an ICOM 7600. Uh, I have a Elecraft um, antenna tuner and amplifier. Um, you know, we use high gain rotator controllers. Uh, I have a remote antenna switch, um, uh, et cetera. And I also have a Rig Blaster Pro interfaced in for single sideband uh, to my radio. A uh, bunch of software, which I'll show you here in a few minutes, uh, running on the on the Win 10 computer. Uh, similar to Paul, I'm, I built my computer, but it probably cost me 300 bucks. You know, it wasn't particularly expensive. Um, both uh, the remote station and myself were both on Comcast internet, although again, I've operated from all around the country. Uh, as Paul said, we use Splash Top and I have uh, the Wi-Fi AC power controllers. Um, Here's kind of a block diagram of, of the station. Um, as you can see, lots of USB or RS-232 connections into the computer from all the equipment um, and uh, you know, all powered from uh, you know, 12 volt power supply except for the amplifier, which is uh, running from 220. Uh, and here's some pictures. The one on the left is, is the setup at, at the uh, station. Um, the big box in the middle at the top there is the computer, amplifier, antenna tuner next to it, rig blaster, power supply, antenna switch, and then my 7600 on, on the lower, lower level there. And then um, uh, the picture on the right is the setup I had up at Evergreen. Again, two monitors uh, for all the uh, station equipment. So Paul and I had fun. Uh, we did an interesting little remote down in Crested Butte, Colorado, and when we were, I was down there for vacation. Um, I was down uh, for one month back in 2019, um, and uh, uh, so we had had plenty of opportunity to do remote operation. Uh, the local internet there I was using was DSL. <laughs> um, it was good enough, again, uh, you know, for uh, for at least receiving the screen images and, and controlling the, the, the radio. Um, we did, uh, we, we, we both operated the CQ Worldwide VHF contest back in 2019, in, in July of 2019. And Paul was visiting me at the time. So I was set up in one part of the house running my station. He was set up in another part of the house running his station. We'd run back and forth and see who was doing better in the contest. It was it was a lot of fun, and uh, you'll notice there uh, that I did have some liquid refreshment helping me out during the contest. Always beneficial uh, for a, uh, a VHF contest. So it was true head-to-head -head competition. I tried uh, to get him drunk. Yeah, and I tried to sabotage your computer. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had some fun doing that. Um, we've had fun also operating my remote station um, in some contests. And here's a couple of the contests that we operated in, um, some digital and RIDI contests. And, uh, you know, we won some awards doing that. Um, you know, all the credit goes to the antennas, uh, not so much to the operators, right, Paul? Um, <laughs> Well, we had to stay up late. Yeah, right. We had to keep each other awake or something. But um, again, one of the fun things you can do with remote station is you can do multi-operator and you don't have to physically travel to that station uh, uh, to do that. And we would uh, stagger our operating shifts and, and all the things you, you normally do. Uh, it all seems to work out very well. And finally, a couple other points. Um, you know, we've talked about operating the stations, but I think both Paul and I have really enjoyed the projects of building the stations and debugging issues and tweaking it and adding features over time. It's definitely something that takes a while to complete. And uh, again, we had a lot of fun uh, doing all that. 
Uh, the other thing that I've noticed is quite a lot of clubs are now building remote stations for their members to operate. Um, I've run into any number of them now that are in the process of doing that. Uh, several here in the Denver area are doing it, and I'm aware of others around the country that are doing it. Um, you know, let's not forget that if you're setting up a remote station, it's no different than having one at your house. Lightning protection, grounding is important. You do want to be able to power all the equipment down. You want to be able to at least have some, maybe some kind of switch to disconnect uh, your antennas also. Um, you know, keep the driving distance reasonable or have a buddy who's close by on site. Because in spite of everything we've said, um, you know, a cable gets loose or something else happens and you may have to go over and tweak with the thing from time to time. And this is outside of the normal maintenance you would do in on antennas and everything else. Stations are a little bit more complicated, you know, things, things do happen. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, adding, adding your software to the computer startup sequence is a great thing. It just saves a lot of time. And now, Paul, I'm going to leave you for the big announcement. I don't know how big it is. I'm, I'm, so my daughter is um, renting the house out, which means um, I had to take the radios out. And I just took the antennas down last weekend with a bunch of help from uh, guys uh, down in Colorado Springs and up in Fort Collins. And uh, we were able to uh, uh, put everything together and move it all down to temporary location is near Colorado Springs in Peyton. And <clears throat> this is gonna be my, my target site. If you can, you can see the, uh, I, you can't really see, but this is a, 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 an aerial picture of where I'm gonna be going. <laughs> I think and it's right see, there, right, Paul? Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, there's not a lot of neighbors, <laughs> you can tell. There's power there and, and stuff like that. And they also got a small uh, 60 foot uh, dish that they use for, um, for deep space uh, uh, radio teles uh, telescope. And um, uh, we also use it for uh, um, 1296 uh, EME contests. So uh, coming up this um, October and November, there is a couple of weekends there where we're gonna be operating uh, 1296 uh, with that dish. I think it, 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 it's got like, Two, 200 million watts or something of ERP. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it uh, you can burn a hole through the moon. Anyway, it's it, it'll be fun to, uh, to operate there. They're building a building there by 30 feet by 60 feet, and uh, it won't be ready till next summer. And that's uh, that's when I'll be able to move my station there uh, permanently and uh, operate from there. Yeah, and if you want to learn more, just Google DSES, right, Paul? Yep, DSES uh, yeah. uh, is the uh, is the uh, is the. It's more than cozy. It's fueled for more. I like rings on there. One hundred. Oops. Oh, there we go. Okay. I just muted him. <laughs> um, anyway. So anyway, you know that's that's our presentation. Um, a couple things. Uh, First of all, I mentioned that there's an appendix several times. We are going to post this to the files section of the groups.io uh, site for front range six meters. I'll just flip through it here. Um, it has all the links for software, for hardware, different websites, other software tools, Node Red, et cetera. So a lot of links back here for pretty much everything we talked about if it wasn't already. Uh, link to in the it, presentation. You tell me, just go through them slowly for the for the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Here's soft, soft, some software things, um, and uh, things that we mentioned uh, here. Um, some hardware things, some of the hardware equipment that we mentioned, uh, and some things we didn't mention. Uh, for example, the Elecraft K4, you know, has a remote operating functionality. Um, some websites that, you know, you can uh, go to remote hams, uh, radio, etc. A couple of the blogs and things that we mentioned. Um, um, some, a lot of the other software tools that we use. Again, you may already be using these in your normal station operation. Uh, that remod that Paul mentioned, it's a remote audio 
uh, server, but also has the ability to do a push to talk uh, control through that uh, set of utilities, um, some other things. And then if you've got it, it all interested in the node red thing that Paul mentioned that he used, you can also uh, go ahead and um, you know find out what they're all about. And again, these are all live links uh, on the version of, of the of the presentation will be posted on, on the website. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes demoing my station, but before we do that, are there any, any questions at this point? Everything crystal clear? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, it's all figured out. Well, again, take some time and patience and you know, feel free to reach out to any of us or any any people, other people you know. So let me uh, just uh, go back to the remote station here, and uh, still running. That's good. It's like uh, so. This is uh, this is my remote station. Um, I'm going to show you the other monitor here, but this is the one that has the uh, you know WSJTX and JT Alert and my logging program log for OM that I use. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're on 15 meters right now. Uh, antennas uh, uh, tri-bander at about 90 feet pointed west right now. So we're getting Japan and uh, Australia and some other things. Um, let me just slide this over to show the other monitor. Uh, so this is more of the equipment side. Um, this is down here, lower left, the antenna rotator. It's the you know, PST rotator. Some of you may be familiar with that software. Uh, this is my uh, amplifier KPA 500 desktop utility, uh, antenna tuner, uh, antenna switch, and then the front panel for, for the radio. And uh, I'm now going to do something here. I'm going to actually move the amplifier icon over here. So that when I slide uh, the screen, so I'm halfway between the two monitors, uh, I can actually see what I'm doing here. And let me um, make sure that uh, we're set up properly here. Uh, whoops. Okay, SWR is all right. Put it in operate. Uh, so we got here, okay, about 400 watts coming out. And uh, let's wait, maybe respond to one of these CQs here and see if we can work somebody. Okay, let's try this guy. And again, I have an audio interface, which I'm not running right now, which lets me listen to uh, listen to the radio. So it just helps keep me awake so I know when I'm transmitting and when I'm receiving. Keeps his wife awake, too. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm down in the basement. Uh, let's see here. There we go. So just slide this over a little bit more so you can see the what happens here when the contact completes. Oh, All right, so I get the normal log screen, I hit OK, and it ends up being going into my logging program here. So it's that easy, just as if I was sitting right in front of the equipment. Um, in fact, uh, again, I really don't notice the latency. Sure, there's a little bit. And when I'm operating sideband contests um, and I'm, you know, uh, whoops, what do you know? Someone else wants to work me. <laughs> um, I, I will sometimes miss the first, you know, if, if, if you're lucky and you're calling CQ and you get a pile up coming back to you, which has happened to me in a few contests, 
Uh, you get a lot of stations calling you. I'll sometimes miss the first letter of someone's call if they're really fast on the switch. Uh, but, you know, easy enough to work that through by just, you know, giving, giving you part of the call there. Um, well, it looks like Japan has woken up, huh? Yeah, one, one more thing, Bill, is you can sometimes set up uh, audio uh, files at your remote site that you can access with your keyboard. And that way, if you want to uh, <clears throat> basically, you know, have your call sign or you're trying to work a guy and you know, on sideband, you just hit a key and it'll send out you know, your call, uh, your, your voice call to the guy. So it's yeah, I, do, I, I actually, yeah, I actually do that all the time um, when I'm operating in a sideband contest with N1MM. I just create some audio files again on that remote computer. N1MM knows how to handle them and I can just, you know, press the function keys on my end uh, to cause it to, to do different things. Um, so anyway, I said, it looks like we're getting into Japan pretty well right now. Um, <laughs> we can hear the, uh, the, the JT alert. Uh, Is that coming uh, through? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, if that's coming through, then let's try this. Tell, tell me what, uh, can you hear that? Paul, oh, you're, you're muted, I, so I can't tell. It was just a little bit there, it wasn't, wasn't too loud. Yeah, but I'm able to, again, if I flip on another one of my software programs here, I can hear the uh, audio coming back from the radio too. Very good, and yeah, you have audio links also in um, in uh, uh, in any desk as well as um, uh, Splash Talk. You, yeah. They have their own audio audio circuits as well, so you can listen to that. Right, right. Anyway, so that's that's it. Um, if there aren't any further questions, I think we'll close down for tonight. As I said, uh, you know, the uh, presentation will be available on the website. And then Paul will post the video probably sometime tomorrow. Hey, Bill and Paul, did, did you guys say, this is Bob, KB0JI, did you say that um, it's actually fairly easy to set it up with FT8? I thought, well, there's all these other programs I got to have running, but it's actually pretty easy to accomplish that. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's no different than um, if uh, if you're doing it you know, on your normal station, which is you've got to have uh, the audio interface available for WSJTX or JTDX and then the cat control. Mm -hmm. And again, um, <laughs> geez, uh, look at all this. <laughs> uh, I'll wait until the next go round, see who's still calling me. Um, but uh, What's nice about the way we do it is it's all running on the same computer that's sitting right next to the radio, right? So it's all local, if you will. We're not trying to send the, the WSJTX audio back and forth, uh, you know, uh, from, from one location to another, okay? It's all done locally there uh, on that computer next to the, next to the radio. Mm -hmm. Paul, yeah. Yeah, let us know when you're uh, when you're uh, wanting to set something up there, Bob, and and Bill and I'll come over there, and you can service some eight oh sevens. And <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's a price involved in being your buddy, so you know. Yeah, yeah, but we, okay. we can come over there. And, we can tolerate that. <laughs> yeah, we can just download some software, and we'll have you we'll have you operating in in no time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I think Paul, you can stop the recording and uh, we'll say good night. And I'll uh, I'll work Japan for the next hour. <laughs> All right, seven three guys. Yep. Uh, stop Thanks, the everybody. recording Thank now. You yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Very nice.